Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Really excited for today's live recording from Miami with Taylor Monick of CleanSpark. Taylor is an immersion mining expert. We talk about the history of immersion mining, current cycle immersion setups, and common pitfalls. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, really excited for this conversation. We've been DMing on Twitter for quite a while. You are the immersion whisperer in my inbox and also one of the preeminent immersion experts in the mining field. So it's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, awesome what you're doing in the space and continuing to put out good content. Thank you. Yeah. So today, hopefully, we can match that uh, or even surpass. Uh, that is entirely on you, my friend. We will we'll see if you are up to the task. I think you are. Uh, let's talk about immersion mining. We're going to go through the history of immersion mining. You have been there for a lot of it, um, for my, for Bitcoin mining, at least obviously immersion has existed for quite a while, even before Bitcoin mining, but let's go through the history of that. And then we'll go into what people are thinking around about right now, how people are thinking about the, the capital decisions they have to make when it comes to immersion. Uh, and then lastly, finish up with CleanSpark, which is not only one of the preeminent miners right now, but on the cutting edge of, uh, immersion technology and immersion implementation so yeah we'll start with the history of immersion mining you can take that wherever you want if you want to introduce yourself first that'd actually probably be good as well yeah yeah no problem so yeah my name is uh taylor modic vp of mining over at clean spark uh have a you know deep history in immersion cooling coming a company called tmg core before this um and when i guess when you think about the history of immersion cooling the the concept really starts at like oil cooled transformers right been around for a very long time and at, at some point i think ibm in the 70s or 80s sometimes decided to start cooling uh computers with fluid right so a lot of we'll call it benchtop testing you know single chip type stuff and in if you're a thermodynamics person definitely some really interesting things to go through and, and find about the history of immersion right so yeah definitely started with uh, oil cool transformers moving into you know small lab type setups and you know you have multiple types of immersion cooling and we'll include hydro in that just for the conversation right so like hydro is is bringing water to the the chip level using a water cooling block and then you have single phase immersion which to your point is is what everybody's deploying right now and what everybody's you know trying to to figure out um and then you have a, a really exciting one called two phase immersion cooling where the fluid is is actually boiling which was much more prominent back you know in 2015 and, and 16 which i guess we'll get into the history of that right so you see a lot of exciting projects in the 2015 through 2017 a lot of really interesting innovation so if you were to go into a mine today such as clean sparks you know norcross facility right you're going to see single phase immersion just stock miners we take the fans off load some firmware and, and basically dunk them in this oil um, in 2015, 16, 17, companies like, you know, Bitfury, Cointera, you know, TMG, um, were actually doing some pretty exciting stuff where, you know, custom-made miners, custom-made interfaces, custom-made power supplies, you know, for example, Bitfury, Azerbaijan, amazing project, I believe it was uh, 40 megawatts of two-phase immersion, uh, custom-made black backplane, which is like a way of interconnecting the miners. So today you typically see, you know, your split cable, right? If you're a, a miner user, your C19 or whatever it is for the, the Watts miners. Um, Back then, you know, they created a custom like PCB backplane where you basically take a custom built miner that's vertical instead of this shoebox type device that we have now, uh, plug it into the backplane and that's like its interface for both internet and power, right? So really dense, really small designs. Um, you know, two phase immersion is basically you take a, a engineered fluid, put it in a tank, run power through the miners, obviously get them hashing. That fluid is going to be taking the heat away in the form of vapor vapor will rise up to a cooling coil and basically drop down. There's no pumping method. So really it's the end all be all of, of how you cool things because there's no mechanical interface, right? It's just doing it, running cold water through the other side and rejecting the heat to like a dry cooler or a cooling tower. Um, and that's where like a lot of the innovation sparked. The fluid's really expensive, upwards of $300 a gallon. So putting a shoebox type miner in that kind of setup is never going to be profitable. So Bitfury um, came up with a really cool backplane type concept. Um, you know, at TMG Core, we worked with Kanan to produce a uh, vertical type hashing guard, very similar, but we used like a, a wire based approach and a big bus bar connection to do our power. But uh, it, it was just a lot more innovation, a lot more excitement around, you know, what, what can you build? How can you drive density? Like, where's the ultimate profitability going to be, right? Um, and I think, obviously, you know, the Bitcoin going down to 3K and I think 2017, you know, really killed off a lot of that innovation. People aren't willing to invest that type of money to find, you know, a 2%, a 3%, a 5%. It's more like, okay, how do we, how do we stay alive, right? 
build the, the cheapest infrastructure we can, buy the machines as cheap as we can, and really kind of ride that market out. And the people that did ride that market out, hats off, you know, obviously the big 60K run, it all paid off in the end. But that's when the, let's call it, it went from innovation to like a commodity. So you go from all these cool custom-made miners, custom-made PCB backplanes, power delivery shelves, like all this really cool innovation. And then uh, the price goes down and it kind of turns into a commodity. So now you see you know, what's the cheapest tank you can get? You know, I'm not going to run a cooling tower, God forbid, because of the, the water costs. I'm going to go to a dry cooler so there's no water involved at all. Um, and just really simple, right? Stock miner, take the fans off, load the firmware, and, and basically get it hashing. Everyone's running, you know, single phase oil and the two phase has kind of, you know, died off. So hopefully if we see another, you know, major price run, we'll get back into that age of innovation. I think you're seeing it from companies like uh, What's Miner producing the M56S, completely designed around immersion. The board's different, you know, all the materials are different. It's really designed to be an immersion, which, you know, I think that's where we all need to go in order to be, you know, as efficient as we can and, and operate the best we can. But it, it just kind of, it's, it's been interesting to see. Huge wave of innovation completely died off. Now we're in this commodity thing. Build it as cheap as you can. Okay, we went through a lot there. That was like, a, that was like ice skating uh, going really, really quickly. Let's go back to the bid for yourself, 2015, 2016. What were some of the people thinking about this time? What were some of the companies that were involved, some of the big players who were working on this stuff? And like you said, they were trying to like innovate, but that was more about just like having fun at the time or was it really just to get that scrappy one to 2%? This is before the big run up in the bull run 2017. Well, when you look at like difficulty way back then, right? Like completely different playing field. So I think the the mindset from a lot of the users from 2015 to 17 is, is how do I acquire as much Bitcoin as I can, right? Like I don't think I ever heard the word underclocking, but I certainly heard the word overclocking a lot during that time, right? It was everybody's, how can I plug in as much miners and, and basically just pull down as much Bitcoin as I can? Because, you know, this is when the S9 would pay itself back and then we're talking weeks rather than, you know, yeah, it's like we are talking about miners now, right? Um, so yeah, no, people were really just pushing like, how dense can I build it? You know, how efficient can I run it? And then how much Bitcoin can I ultimately get? And, you know, that's one of the huge things about immersion everyone talks about, right, is, is overclocking. You buy a box for 100 terahash, it's very easy to get 140 terahash out of it if it's cooled correctly, it can run for a very long time. So I think, yeah, people's mindset then was, how do I get as much Bitcoin as I can? And, and how do I do it in a way that allows me to deploy where the energy is cheap, right? You, air cooling is very successful and it's, it's, it's you know, we, we talk about running air-cooled data centers, so they're not really data centers. They're like a hybrid data center built for Bitcoin mining, right? But it can be done extremely well. Uptime can be great. Efficiency is great. All those types of things, right? But you are kind of limited, you know, from the thermal perspective of where you can deploy. If you want to deploy in a very hot area, you know, those types of things. Version or hydro cooling is really your only option. So I think that was some of the case too, where there's cheap power in very kind of combative climates, and they needed to figure out a way to operate there. Um, that, that's where I think people set the rep. Okay. And then your background in this, how did, I might be mispronouncing, was it TMG or DMG? TMG. TMG, that's right. Uh, there is a DMG now, so I'm like, yeah. keep them. TMG, how did you get into this and how did you like get into the immersion side of Bitcoin mining in the first place? Oh, so, okay. Um, yeah, go back up the track even a little. Yeah, back up the track even <laughs> more, right? So, uh, I think it was 16 or, or 17, I think it was like right over that winter break, um, really kind of took the bite on Bitcoin mining, right? Just totally got the bug, was over the moon about it. Um, one of my good friends, Jake, who's actually the CTO of TMG Core, had been running data centers for like 15 years, right? Um, so I get really interested in mining, you know, start trying to poke around and see what I can do. Remember that he's big in the data center industry, start bugging him. So we just kind of combined forces and started working on a project that we called Bit Everest. Uh, Bit Everest was the catalyst that kind of started TMG Core. We went and got funding for Bit Everest, had a a group of people that were willing to work with us. They wanted some like oversight or, or and whatnot. So that's kind of how the team came together. Um, and then, you know, we started, you know, mining there in Dallas, Texas. First one was in Houston. So TMG started up, you know, as a mining company. First deployment in Houston, S9s and like L3s. You know, pretty exciting time. Prices running, all that kind of stuff. Um, we got a really nice deal on a, a data center in Dallas. A huge, you know, power allotment there, over 100 megawatts. Um, and frankly, we got in the building. The landlord didn't want us cutting all the holes in the walls to do air cooling, right? So we came in, showed him, hey, this is where we put all these louvers. So here's where we're going to cut all this stuff out. Landlord, you know, frankly, just, you know, wasn't pleased and yeah, that's not going to work. And that's when we pivoted to start looking at immersion cooling. Um, and we contacted 3M, some some really great guys, Phil Tuma and uh, Steve Pagato picked up the phone. And uh, we all flew out to Minnesota and started working with Phil pretty, you know, intimately. And, you know, he's a what I call the, the godfather of two-phase. I mean, he's truly just a, a world-class expert. And the best part about him is, is he just loves to teach. He's put his, you know, frankly, probably 20 years of his career into engineered fluids and in making everything. 
Um, so we just spent a ton of time with him and started working on our first uh, skid based, you know, one megawatt, two phase immersion cooled um, apparatus. So that way, you know, we only had to cut very small holes in the wall to run the water lines rather than, you know, the hundreds of thousands of square feet of louver space that we needed to run air cooled. And that's really like how TMG got started. You know what I mean? And it just kind of went down a rebel from there. I love that. So now we're in 2017, 2018. What does the market look like at that point? Is big washouts, not that many people interested in the space, just a lot of tinkering still and engineering on the side? No, when the, when the price went down, I mean, interest absolutely died. Yeah, that was like a, a very tough part in the market, I think, for, for everybody that was involved, right? Especially the the high that everybody was on. I mean, that was one of the first and most exciting times of my life, watching it run up to 30K. You know, just being involved and getting started and, you know, getting our company funded and doing all that. So, yeah, no, I mean, price price went away. Interest definitely, you know, went away. And that's when TMG kind of pivoted towards, you know, more data center type applications and utilizing that same technology we developed for mining, you know, over in the data center space, typical, like, what do you call x86 data center operations. Gotcha. And just a little bit more on the players in the space, I'm interested to know, because my understanding is like, and you said this even before we started, there's other data centers that do use this or technology is just different. Who are the kind of people who are like becoming interested in immersion historically and have like set their foot into it? Is it miners for the most part, or is it really just like people who have backgrounds in the immersion space from other industries coming in or like, oh, this Bitcoin thing like fits with my understanding of fluids and, and all that? Uh, so it's like multifaceted, like the largest implications and adoption has been from, from crypto mining because it's so dense and there's so much power used, right? Um, and so that's where it's seen the biggest, like riots, 200 megawatt facility, right? Is, is huge. CleanSpark has a relatively, you know, large immersion deployment and there's several others like uh, Rhodium, et cetera. Um, but in the other area, the, the biggest thing you'll see is from like high performance, uh, compute users, right? So people that are deploying a ton of GPUs, you know, really high end CPU type processors, that's where immersion cooling becomes really beneficial. Um, like I, I talked about a little bit earlier, we run like a hybrid of what you would call a data center, right? So a true data center is going to have redundant power, redundant cooling, crazy air filtration, humidity controls. It's it's truly like a it's like a safe box for your computer to operate in, right? Um, in Bitcoin mining, obviously the profit margins aren't there to build that type of facility and, and, and make money. So we run a, a hybrid type data center, right? With uh, let's call it low air filtration, right? No air conditioning, no redundant power in most cases, right? Things like that. It's it's a completely different world so in, in the stat standard data center industry if you have like a 1.4 poe so 40 percent of it's going towards cooling like that that's good and so like people that have high performance computer or, or gpus high end cpus that produce a lot of heat if you can go from a 1.4 poe to a one point let's just call it 05 poe or one let's even call it 1.1 it's a 30 percent savings on like your operations and it's it's huge right so you'll see like facebook and google and microsoft all using two immersion in different spaces, right? So Microsoft is using two-phase immersion on their Azure. It's like live. People are using it day in and day out. Really cool project. Um, Facebook's using it, I believe, for like cooling hard drives, right? So like everybody knows that like immersion is how you get there, but you also have to remember like a lot of CTOs in a $50 million data center are going to bet their jobs on like this new technology. Air conditioning is tried and proven and, and all those types of things, but more and more people are going to go over to immersion cooling. The benefits are are there. There's no like questioning right is it a better form of cooling absolutely right now in the crypto industry it's like do you want to pay for that but everywhere else it's you know being taken up okay yeah let's well, tell you the, the capital question uh which is definitely been bad around in telegram and twitter channels um let's keep going with the timeline though because I, I think we got a thing going here so we're past the fall of bitcoin 2017 2018 now we're in bear market 2019 2020 what was the immersion scene looking like at that point? Where were people with designs? Where were people with enthusiasm for it? Uh, was it kind of moved away from immersion or was there people like tinkering up with things still? So I think that's where you see the split from like the, what I'd call like the really fun, exciting, cool innovation over to like, how do we make immersion a commodity? Like how do I build the cheapest tanks we possibly can make them work? So was the interest there? Yeah. And if I sounded a little negative before, like there were still people interested in immersion, right? Like the industry wasn't dead. It just at the CapEx and everything like that, right? It was a different approach. Um, but that's when you really see single phase immersion or oil-based cooling, you know, however you want to put it. That's when that really came to be more and more marketable, right? So the fluid is instead of $300 a gallon, it's called $30 a gallon, right? Much cheaper. Um, it's also much easier to operate, right? So two phase immersion tanks need to be extremely clean. If you leave the top off, you're going to boil away thousands of dollars of fluid, right? Um, it's a lot more upkeep. While you do get a lot of benefits out of it, it needs to be ran in more, let's call it like a 
professional environment. Um, single phase oils are extremely tough, right? There's, you can run tanks with no lids, like it's extremely cheap. It's not going to evaporate. It just, it's much more fitted, I think, for Bitcoin mining than, than two phase is. Um, and so that's when you see like companies like GRC and Midas and all of them really like come into the fold. They've each had deployments, you know, with other public traded companies and things like that, that have, uh, like in my opinion, I think gone well. Um, but that's that's where we really see the split is post 2017 two phase immersion and Bitcoin mining wasn't really talked about. It was all, you know, oil based cooling and single like basically single phase. And we're around the same place right now as of twenty twenty three, or has it changed even further in the last two years, three years? Uh so I think we're in a very similar place, right? So everybody's still doing single phase cooling. That's like definitely what's being marketed. Like if you go down to the conference today, right, you're not gonna see a single two phase player there. It's all gonna be single phase players. One exciting thing that I do see on the market is, you know, people are now actually starting to make miners for immersion. So like what's miner came out with the M56 plus the guys over at Aerodyne are coming out with a new miner. They were going to make an immersion option. I think the same thing from chain reaction, right? So we're seeing a lot more people building hardware specific to immersion, and that's going to make it much more beneficial because a lot of people want to talk about the nuances of immersion. And I like to remind them. Well, we're building systems around air-cooled boxes. What happens when we actually make the machines for immersion and actually take advantage of everything that you can do from a design perspective in order to make those machines more efficient, cost efficient, produce a higher hash rate, et cetera. Like we're in an industry right now that's adapting air-cooled boxes and it's still that good. Still that good. Okay. So let's go really quickly through the two phase and one phase again. You've already said this at the beginning, but I just want to have like a little more clarification around it. What was the reason again for two phase dying off and everyone moving to one phase it was just a capital cost? So I think the the reason why it dies off is is the fluid costs and like the uh, initial capex investment. No longer were the days where you're making you know returns in weeks rather than than in years, right? And that that changes people's opinion. And I also think people found out that single phase, when done correctly, could work for the situation that we have. It's cheaper, it's easier to manage, and we're going to go this route rather than. You can get extreme densities, you know, get all these efficiency gains out of two phase, but it's going to be a lot harder to manage. It's going to cost a lot more to deploy. And right now the margins really just like aren't there. And I think that holds true because we haven't seen it come back today and the margins, you know, haven't, haven't been there. Is there anyone running two phase right now that you know of I can act? Not, not that I'm aware of in the crypto space. I could be wrong. Uh, there's a cool group called Rosso that is uh, coming to market. I think they might have a two phase offering, but I don't, I don't know of anybody right now that's running it like in a production environment. If you were running it and you hear this podcast, give me an email uh, and we could talk. So let's, let's go through some of the decisions being made here and, and why people are running um, immersion mining, why CleanSpark, even for instance, is choosing to run immersion versus like an air-cooled air cooled site. Like you've kind of listed some of the stuff how like the capital costs, like the longevity of machines. But for someone who's still just like kind of walking into this and like confused about the two options, what would you give them to them as like a 101? Yeah, so the reasons to go immersion or for one like uptime, like we always talk about uptime as an industry, right? How 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 much is your miner online? Um, immersion provides the ability to stay online pretty much no matter what the thermal environment is outside, whether it's 110 or it's 30 degrees, you're going to be able to you know stay online, stay up. Um, the other nice part about immersion is like the heat control of how liquids transfer heat is much greater than how air transfers heat. Um, the boxes stay in like a more uniform profile. So there's not like crazy hot spots and crazy cold spots. And if you're at home thinking about it, if you were to turn your oven up to like 425 degrees, let it heat up, open the oven, slide your hand in, don't touch anything, pull it out. It's hot. It's uncomfortable, but your hand's fine. You go ahead and boil the water. Boil Water boils at a much lower temperature. Even if so much touch it, you know, your significant others will be driving you to the hospital, right? So the way that fluids transfer heat is just exponentially greater. It allows your miner to be in a more uniform setting where it's not going to break. The temperatures are typically much lower, right? So the miner's going to last a lot longer. The other part about it is, is talk to any miner what breaks the most. It's fans and, and power supplies, right? Power supplies mostly break because they get dirty and they get hot. That doesn't happen in immersion. The other thing is the fans are gone. So like on your typical S19 box, you got two fans in the front, two fans in the back, three in the power supply. Those are all failure points, going to slow down your operation. When you go immersion, you immediately remove those, right? So like you're removing points of failure, you're increasing your machine's lifetime, you're increasing your uptime in most cases. Um, and that's not to say that air cooled sites can't have great uptime because they absolutely can. So not knocking air cooled at all, just kind of going through the process. And I think the biggest thing is overclocking, right? Like we talk about cost per terahash, cost per terahash, cost per terahash. Well, if, if we can buy a hundred terahash box at $8 a terahash, turn it into 120 
terahash, right? That's extremely beneficial for our business, especially with immersion, better cooling. You know, the S19 series is extremely affected by heat. It's much more efficient when it's cold than when it's hot, right? So there's all these things where you can do some cool stuff with the miners with firmware to make them hash more than the stock clock rate at a more efficient than, you know, the stock out of the box tools per terahash. Um, and that, that trade-off is extremely beneficial. Um, you can also manage it with a lot, a lot less people, right? There's like a lot less upkeep. You use a lot less parts, a lot less maintenance. It, you generally dunk the miner, set the miner. You basically never go back to touch the miner. Obviously, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's just a lot less upkeep than your traditional air-cooled site. Gotcha. Okay. Again, you're very good at like laying this out. It's like you've done this for a living. So let's go through some of like the innovations that you've seen recently that are interesting to you. Uh, and I, I asked that question with like a little background being, if you're looking at the immersion space and you don't have your head in it like you do, or even pay attention to it in a general sense, like you're completely lost. There's a lot of operators out there. There's a lot of different options and you don't know what you're getting. So what are some things that you kind of look at or like, wow, that's a actual innovation, whether it's like on the fluid side or maybe on the miner side or like the management of it? Uh, yeah, I think the, the biggest one right now is, is hats off to what's miner with the M56, right? Um, not only is it, it's extremely dense. Like if you go, you know, look at one at the, the conference, it's extremely small. Um, they built the hash cards, like around immersion on where they put the chips and how they put everything together and the heat sinks, like the whole nine yards. Right. Um, and then they actually changed the power delivery. Right. So it's not your typical, um, power delivery that you see on the, uh, the, the AM miners, let's call it, it's, it's one step higher. So it's a little bit more efficient. Um, and they obviously, and also, sorry, um, include the ability to like change the power profiles, right? So they built in some overclocking, some underclocking, right? So they made it more adaptable for what people are doing in immersion. They built the rum miner all around immersion. And I think that's really exciting to see because like, again, we're just adapting the air when you kind of, I don't want to give away some of the like secret stuff that we're working on, right? Or, or where I think the industry should go, but there's a lot more you can be doing than just dunking an air cold box. And it's, it's amazing to see what's minor taking that first step. Like I saw today, Caden also came out with an immersion minor with their newest 13 series, which is, you know, fantastic to see. So hats off to the, the minor providers right now. They're the people that I think are innovating the most. Um, a lot of the immersion type stuff lately has been not like copycats, but they're very similar, right? Single phase immersion, trying to keep the price down, very lackluster on like sensors and all that kind of stuff. Just really like kind of bare bones to get you hashing and, and make you profitable. Um, so I'd not definitely not duplicates, but very similar offerings in the market for the last like couple of years. And there's been like a lot of patent questions around like the single phase stuff, right? Where a lot of people have built some sort of mining trough and then like, you know, been upset other people are using it. Do you have an opinion on that particular or something you can share information about with that? Um, I mean, I think like if you're a, if you're a miner, you definitely can tell who's copied who, right? Like I don't, I don't need to be spilling names or, or causing drama, but it, it's, it's a pretty obvious thing. Um, you know, that comes with like, you know, kind of a two-pronged approach, right? So like being an inventor, it's, uh, you definitely want to see your invention, I guess, uh, respected in the sense of like if you found a patent, the other inventors out there know how much paperwork goes into that and the whole process and getting it approved. I mean, it means a lot, right? As like an engineer, that type of thing. So like, I respect that, but it's also on the other side, like, it's hard to see other people as competitors in Bitcoin mining because we're all doing the same things. So we are competitors and, and all that kind of stuff. But as a technologist, I kind of always look to like, we should be sharing technology that's going to make everything more efficient. That's going to be making everything better. Um, so I can see it from like both sides, but yeah, there's definitely some like direct copies and duplicates. I'm sure there's lawsuits going on, right? I don't know who they're with, but obviously behind closed doors, but it's you know, kind of clear. I have a feeling you do know those lawsuits, but we won't push you on that one. Let's go back to the the big ASIC manufacturers. Um, I always get questions from like listeners or from other people who are interested about like where Bitmain specifically is pivoting, but you did bring up uh, Kanan and the micro BT as well. So we can lump them into the conversation. Bitmain with its big hydro antliner box and then some of its other uh, like individual units has been seemingly pushing towards hydro. And with the Kanan and micro BT developments, the, the thing I'm thinking of is like, are these big manufacturers just realizing that air-cooled units are so much trouble that they're trying to push the industry towards something else? Or are they just providing variety and you know they'll make something if someone wants to buy it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think they're adapting to customer needs, right? So uh, more and more of the power is in areas like, you know, West Texas, West Texas, well, West Texas for example, right? Um, where the power is extremely cheap most of the time, but it's, you know, hot, dusty, and all those types of things out there, right? And we talked about earlier, you know, it, 110 outside, are you going to go air conditioning or are you going to go immersion or are you going to go offline? And, you know, there's there's different ways to do it. Bitmain, a lot of people don't realize this, actually did the hydro for the S9. It's not new technology. Liquid chip's been in data centers for, for years now, right? 
Um, and there's some advantages and disadvantages of that. And, you know, Bitmain decided to, to go down that route and they're producing the whole entire unit. What's Miner's taking a split approach? They have both an immersion pool and they also have the product that they're producing with HeatCore, which is like an all-in-one hydro type setup. And then it looks like Kanan's betting, you know, on immersion. So I think the mining providers are just like listening to their customers. They need some flexibility of deployment. Um, and I think as people get more and more used to immersion and actually go to some successful deployments and see like how good it can be, I just think the industry will continue to grow and grow and grow. I think, you know, obviously Riot's adoption at 200 megawatts is a big vote of confidence that way, right? Uh, Clean Spark also, you know, we just finished up our immersion deployment down in Norcross and, you know, it's gone extremely well. So I think as people see more and more, whether it's, you know, hydro or immersion being successful and being profitable and, and being reliable, people will tend to go down that route. Don't get me wrong. There are some geographical locations where it's cold 24 seven and you really don't, you don't need it. You come up with a good filtration strategy and you know, you're going to be happy 24 seven, but unfortunately it's not that way. And you know, other parts of the world where people still want to, you know, deploy miners at scale. I like Texas, hot and dusty. Uh, you brought up the hydro and immersion debate. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like the, the trade-offs and differences between these two and even can you actually just like walk out the differences for, re for listeners who wouldn't understand or have not heard the two differences there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll start with hydro. Um, if you're a, a gaming PC guy, I think that's like the easiest way to look at it is it's like a water cooled PC, but it's expanded throughout a container with several hundred units. So there's a, a water processing, like a cooling tower that's pumping cold water into tubes. Those tubes are going into basically uh, little plates on the miners that carry the heat away. And it goes through like multiple loops, goes down through the miners back into the cooling tower. So basically you're taking the heat from the miner putting it into water, taking the water to the cooling tower, cooling towers, dispersing it out into the world. Um, and then um, like immersion cooling, you're basically taking cold oil, pumping the cold oil into the bottom of the tank, letting it run itself through the miners, capturing the hot oil at the top. Most people dump it into like a weir system that goes to a plate heat exchanger with water running on the other side. The plates basically cross the waters and the, the oil don't mix from a mixing perspective, but thermally they mix. The oil comes back out cold, the water leaves hot, and again, rejects, you know, at the heat exchanger. Obviously, you know, I'm extremely biased working in immersion cooling for the last, you know, four or five years. So like I do think open bath is the way just because it has so much flexibility. You can put an S19 right next to an M50, right next to an Avalon 1346, and they're all gonna run fine, right? But if you buy like a hydro container, you're gonna be stuck in that container with that specific miner, with those specific parts, right? And I also think that the immersion tanks can last like several generations if the electrical is designed right. You have some flexibility there. Like you're not going to be buying new containers, new hydro, like whenever the miners die, you're just going to take the old miners out and dump the new miners in. Um, but there are some like unique cases where hydro is better for like heat recapture, right? Because like the overall temperature is higher, the transfer is better, that kind of stuff. Um, but from my perspective, I'm a big fan of open bath immersion, single phase or, or two phase. I think that those will ultimately be the end all be all. But um, you know, hydro could certainly, you know, come through and, and get some market capture if done right. Gotcha. What are some things that you're seeing people do that just look bad on the immersion side or on the hydro side, probably the immersion side, since it seems to be like more bespoke designs where people are just creating them themselves or leaning on a third party to make it for themselves. What are some things that you're looking at and be like, uh, that doesn't look quite correct. Um, and then the flip side, positive side, where are some things that you do like that people are doing when you're, we're seeing these designs out there in the wild? Um, from, from a doing things poorly perspective, I think I've heard the most horror stories around just like the total system engineering, right? So like you, you go from basically the miner to the heat exchanger at the bottom of the tank to the final heat rejection and making sure that you have everything from the flow rate to the thermal transfer and all that calculated correctly from start to finish, right? Um, is extremely important. And I don't know if it's because people rushed or, or whatever it is, but we definitely see some disasters where there's either not enough final heat rejection, not enough of the tank, right? And there's issues. I think the other big thing is flow. Like a lot of people don't understand how to properly flow oil through the tanks to make sure everything's like even and, and running well. And like at the system level, again, it's like having all the bits and pieces to like really make it, you know, successful, right? Like you need good hardware, you need firmware, you need like a building management system to manage like the dry coolers and everything. And I think a lot of people try and like kind of cheap out and then get rid of some of those pieces, try and run it manually and then X, Y, and Z. And that, that in the long haul kind of hurts, right? If you just spend the money to do it correctly up front, it's going to pay off for, for years and years and years. Um, and I think people sometimes just don't want to pay that or they think they know better or whatever it is, right? Like whatever. Um, it just ends up kind of biting them in the end. 
some of the cool stuff that I've, you know, seen from people is, you know, there's been a huge burst in, in firmware lately, right? Like with Luxor coming aboard and ASIC.to is out there in brains. It seems to be like a much more talked about topic. So I think there's a lot of cool innovations with immersion in the firmware that you can do not only from an efficiency perspective or under or overclocking, but also with like the power curtailment stuff and, and everything going on. Um, there's just a lot of creativity that could be done there. Um, and I, I, I think something cool that we'll see on the horizon is really integrating like your building management system, your ASICs and the power to really scale everything up and down to make it really fluid. That's where I think there's like some really exciting innovation like on in the future. I don't know how long it'll take or when people will really bite that bullet, um, but it's definitely cool to see what you can do with more flexibility than that. Yeah, if, a few thoughts came to mind when you're speaking about all that, uh, including some of like the poor designs, decisions people have made. Um, Okay, let's leave all that there, and let's go to CleanSpark itself, which is, we've had Zach on twice or three times in the last six months, and for obvious reasons, CleanSpark is just, like, dominating right now. Um, I think you guys are closing in on 16x to hash by mid-year, something like that. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but you can correct me in a second. You guys also have this large immersion deployment. Tell me a little bit about it as much as you can from a public lens, uh, how you guys thought about it, how you thought about designing it, um, sort of walking the listener through like this whole process of an, of creating an industrial scaled immersion model. Yeah, no, absolutely. And appreciate the kind words about CleanSpark. It's been a, definitely been a, a fun ride over the last year. Um, so our, our immersion site is in Norcross, Georgia. Um, it was it, the, the building itself used to be a data center and a call center, a little bit split up, um, apartments on one side, and it's in a general, let's not call it residential, but a, a industrial area. Um, and so we really wanted to keep the noise down and keep the site basically unbothersome to our neighbors, right? We wanted to be respectful neighbors. It's one thing at CleanSpark we really try and do is go into neighborhoods that want us there, that have a mutual benefit for us to be there and work together with the community. Um, so we decided to do immersion there. Um, it is all single phase immersion, um, S19, you know, J pros in there. That's like our, our setup. We worked with uh, Shell Oil as our oil provider. And the site is is fantastic. It's extremely quiet. It's extremely efficient. We've done some really fun stuff with firmware to get some good overclocking numbers, some really good efficiency numbers, um, and, and working with uh, like our different providers from the dry coolers and the tanks and everything. Um, the site runs uh, fantastically, right? It's just super smooth. Uptime is is through the roof, and frankly, just really not having you know too many problems, which is what happens when you get a nice immersion set up. Like it's middle of the summer right now. It'll get up to 95. It, it doesn't even, you know, cause a, a sweat, right? So, yeah, that's our site. It's about 20 megawatts right in the middle of Norcross, Georgia. But it's uh, that's why we built it. Keep it quiet. Keep it, like, respectful for the community. And it's been fantastic. Community's been great to us. We provided a, a whole bunch of jobs. And that's another nice part about, like, aversion, right, is, is not only are we providing, like, what I would call, like, high-tech jobs, basically, like, you know, simplified data center type jobs. Um, but we actually get to teach about like a very unique and cutting edge technology, right? So like all of our techs at, at Norcross are learning about the fluid. They're learning about, you know, different types of, of firmware and then final heat rejection and, and the whole kind of the whole operation. You don't really see that like anywhere else where you get to really share a cutting edge tech with your employees and have them operate it. So um, yeah, the site's been really successful and we're really excited about it. How did you guys like think through the products you're buying to, to build that site? That's one thing that's kind of interesting to me is like, you're going to have to go out and buy the fluid. You're going to go out and buy like the bins. You're going to have to go buy like the wires and stuff like that. How different is it from like an air cooled model where you're going to go out and buy a container set up on a site and just like get it hashing once you can plug it in? I mean, I might be making it too basic, but I find it like, you know, really similar um, from, from one perspective. Like, let's say you're building an air cooled data center. You're going to be calculating, you know, how much air am I bringing in? How much heat is being you know generally produced and how much, you know, air am I pulling out, making sure all that balance is right. And then you go out and pick your vendors from proven sources that you've used before, right? And you kind of go through and build the, the site. Um, it's the same thing with immersion, but you just have to be more careful with like the full stack, right? So you start at the minor level, like start at the minor, say, okay, this is what we want to deploy here. This is the hash rate we want to get here. Then you move to the tank and say, okay, how many miners can each tank support? What is going to be the, the KW coming out of that tank to that plate heat exchanger, right? And then you move up, okay, so I'm going to go buy this dry cooler. I'm going to put this many tanks downstream with this many miners. And you map all that out and make sure the flow rates are good. Thermals are good. Everything's going to make sense. And, you know, you go to your D-Day and say, what's the hottest day of the year going to be? And that's typically what I design around. So that way, if I know I'm going to work on the hottest day, I'm guaranteed to work on the rest of the days. Um, and then, you know, you kind of just talk with other people, their experiences and stuff. When you go to pick a first vendor, that's like a huge thing. I would really 
promote is, is taking your time and making sure that you get the right tank vendor, you get the right oil vendor, because, you know, those two things are really going to make your project either a huge success or a huge failure. Um, and then making sure that you, you really understand what you're doing from a final heat rejection, the climate that you're in, the elevation you're in, like all those types of details to make sure everything from the miner all the way to your dry cooler, cooling tower, whatever's rejecting that final heat all matches up and all makes sense. You know, you have the proper amount of wattage for the overclocking that you want to do, right? All those types of things. That's what stacks up to like a really successful version deployment is, is knowing each part, how they interact with each other, and then building something that is, is built to withstand what you're asking it to do. So like the pushback on it would be from an air cooled perspective, you'd be like, oh, this is really complicated to learn at the forefront. I mean, you've been doing this for over half decade, so longer than that. So it's, it might be a little bit easier for you to like claim that. But I think like an air cooled guy, just like a container would be intimidated to put all that together. Well, what if we push back and said, what if you buy an immersion container? Uh, fair. Because then you're really just dunking miners learning about, you know, either fan spoofers or, or firmware from that point, right? But no, it's definitely a little bit intimidating and you need different staff, right? So like you need a different setup and a different understanding. And, you know, if you're air-cooled site, you're not going to have a water treatment person, like in those types of like little nuances. But yeah, I certainly don't think it's anything like overcomplicated that, that people can't figure out. I mean, we have so many brilliant and bright people in this space, like should yeah. I an issue? Fair, fair. We're not talking down to our listeners. Uh, I'm just personally curious. Last question for you, uh, as we start to wrap up here, we have to bring up the the ever endless and maybe pointless air cooled versus immersion debate on, on the capital side of things, right? Where it's already hard enough to sort of map out when you're going to be profitable with your mining experience uh, because of Bitcoin price and difficulty and all those other factors. From an immersion perspective, how do you think about it? Um, how have you come to the conclusion that it's like the right thing to invest in? Uh, have you already mentioned a few things, obviously, like that your capital has a longer lifespan or your assets have a longer lifespan because of the treatment that they're in. Uh, but at the forefront, you have to put more capital in. So I'll hand it to you. Yeah. So, I mean, at CleanSpark, we both uh, have air-cooled and, you know, version facilities. We're not dedicated to, to one or the other, just to, you know, make that clear. Um, from my perspective, you need to look at what's right for your particular situation, right? So um, it's going to come from like your climate, your energy prices, all those types of things are going to go into saying what is the best environment for for me to, to mine in, right? So if you have somewhere where it's extremely hot and the power is, you know, extremely cheap, probably makes a lot of sense to put immersion in there, overclock everything as, as much as you can because the power is so cheap, you're not really worried about efficiency and uh, go from there. But if you're someone that's deploying in a, a cold climate like Canada and the, the power is expensive, it's probably best to build a, you know, passively cooled air cooled site. And let it sit there and make its money on the stock efficiency and you know be as efficient as you can or underclock it and keep it online so like i'm not dead set on immersion is the right solution for every single deployment i just think it's starting to make a lot more sense uh, as as it goes and the other part is the more people deploy immersion the cheaper all of those components will get right so if we get an option of immersion the pump prices go down plate heat exchanger prices go down tank prices go down oil prices go down and then you start to you know relook at the economics of, of what it is but like, for example, in, in Georgia, with our situation with Norcross, it's extremely hot and, and muggy in the summer. We were in a place where the power prices are great. We needed to be quiet because we're in like an industrial zone and didn't really want to cause a bother of any of our, our neighbors. Um, and we wanted to create a site with low maintenance. Um, you know, those things led us to, to building an immersion site and it's been really successful for us. So I just encourage people to kind of be more creative and, and look at what is the best solution for where you're mining. Love it. Taylor, thank you for joining the Mining Pod. Yeah, thanks for having me.